Today I am interviewing again, for those of you who have been following my channel for a while, Lars Kronje, who is a very well-known hedge fund trader. Lars, it would be great to just introduce yourself, explain your, your background and what you are known for. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I used to run a hedge fund here in London uh, and I still sit on the board of a number of funds. But I guess what I'm better known for is I've written a couple of books about finance. So, the first one was one where um, I described what it's like, you know, especially how did some Danish kid come to run a London-based hedge fund and what was that like and the good and the bad experiences with. And then later I wrote a book about um, essentially about how someone like my mom should invest her money. So the yeah. thinking is, uh, you know, it starts with the premise of who are you as an investor? What do you know? And um, and essentially try to convince the reader that it's overwhelmingly unlikely that they are able to outperform the market um, or beat the market or find someone that could do so for them. And the book is about what should you do with your investments uh, on the basis of that premise. So you are someone who has incredible access to professionals, experts, analysts, the CEOs, you visit these companies, you have this incredible knowledge and yet you are obviously a huge supporter of just simplistic investing um not tr not trying to take on an expert's role but accept what you know and, and and work with what you can can you explain the simplicity of yeah i think one thing just to keep in mind so a lot of people will ask so you're saying markets can't be beat and I'm saying, well, that's not necessarily the right question to ask from the perspective of most people. The, the right question to ask is, can you beat the market? Mm. Whether some person somewhere can do so is, I mean, that's particularly relevant to you. Um, so I'm just saying you can. Assume you can, and we can talk about why that's hard. So you, you alluded to it in your question was this idea that we had some of the best minds in finance working for us. We had access to the best information, best technology, the companies, the data, the markets, super fast speeds, anything you can imagine we would we would have. And even with all of that, it was incredibly hard to beat. Mm -hmm. And I see this firsthand with the funds I'm involved with today. So we can say, if you can't beat the markets, let's just talk about equities for a second. Well, you get to... Um, so that's the first and most important thing about it, because if you come to that conclusion, a lot of stuff will naturally fall. Okay? Okay. So just convince yourself of that. What, what, what I hope you end up at is that you should then, in, in equities at least, buy the broadest, cheapest, and most tax-efficient index tracker you can find get your hands on. Mm. So that's essentially you should buy global equities. Yeah. Okay? So something and like the, the, the Vanguard All World Index ETF. You yeah, know, really cost effective, cheap, long term yeah. buy and hold. Um, so it's not triggering tax. You, you've completely Absolutely. spread all your eggs in one basket, yeah. but you haven't diversified either. And and that's and that's an important point, and for, for several reasons. One is you're obviously not exposed uh, to any geography or industry or size of company. There's some bias there, but 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 if you think of it in the old days. It used to be that Australians would only buy Australian stocks, Brits would buy British stocks, Danes would buy Danish stocks. And that would actually directly add to the concentration that you already have. Right? So most Australians, there are, there are non-investment assets would be stuff like their house, their future income, there may be their, their income, maybe future inheritance. There would be you know, job alternatives. So basically everything ties into the local economy. And, and, and if you then on top of that in your investments, add to that concentration by buying stocks that are also tied to the local economy, you're really putting all your eggs in one basket. So I'm saying with your investments, you should do the opposite. Go as broad as you possibly can. Now, the world has become a lot more interrelated than used to, which is really correlated. And we see that now with this coronavirus, mm. obviously, it's a, the prime example of that. But, yeah. but still, you should diversify as much as you can. In, in in your um, in your investments and obviously for the viewers you know diversifying is obviously but you know helps take some risk off the table um, which is in, you know incredibly important you know for, for some people obviously get very nervous at times like this whereas some people embrace the risk and and it's like a red rag to the bull to a bull you know they they go, go harder and more aggressively someone probably more so like myself but for people who are new to investing you know they're they're taking one step in front of each other 
slowly, conservatively, um, and and carefully. You know, th this is why that diversification is so incredibly important. So just to summarize, um, so I'm, I'm mindful just, of the time, just kind of one but point mm. important. yeah, yeah. So um, you start with the premise also that people are risk averse. Mm. That for a certain expected return, you'd rather have less risk rather than more risk. Yes. Okay. So you have two investments, and one is in the both you expect to make five percent, but one of them you might double your money or lose all your money. And the other, you will certainly make 5%. Mm. You would generally say, well, the second investment is better. Yeah. Right? And and so let me just say that if someone feels the opposite, that first of all, well, go talk to someone, convince yourself otherwise. <laughs> but if you still feel that you all else would go want risk, this is this this is not for you. Okay. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying is, is all based on less risk for the same expected. Okay. All right. Well, that makes perfect sense. Um, just to wrap up, just a few quick questions. Um, even with what's going on in the market right now, for long-term investors, for you know millennials who are watching this video and looking at this, going, "Is this a great time for me to be investing?" If I've got you know long-term goals, I understand the importance of diversification, you know, globally. Um, you know, is this something you would be encouraging for the people who have that long-term investment time horizon? Do you think this is an opportunity of a lifetime? Well, I, I'd be very careful saying stuff like that. Um, I don't think our, I don't think you can time the market. Mm. Right? You can't, I mean, I, I would say just because markets are down a lot because of this coronavirus, it doesn't mean that you know better than it before where the markets are going to go up. Mm. What you do know is that markets are a lot more risky. And the reason we know that, first of all, it sort of feels obvious right? yeah <laughs> you know you know maybe if people see this video in 10 years and they're saying you guys are all idiots <laughs> but certainly at this point we all know that the world is a lot more risky and just mm -hmm. you know it's now mid April 2020 and there's something called the the VIX index which is essentially a measure of expected future volatility of the market mm -hmm. that has quadrupled I should just give you a sense of the increase in the, the, the world. What does that mean? That means that the risk of investing in, in this case in equities mm. is four times higher than yeah. it was before the coronavirus. Mm. So with that, it's not unreasonable to expect future higher returns, right? Risk yeah. returns kind of you know mm. go together. But you do so at higher risk. Mm. It's obvious. And so is that for you? Well that's who you are. Yeah. Can you bear the risk? And if you can bear the risk things going to hell from here you know who knows maybe there's a second nasty wave of the virus but maybe we find a cure tomorrow we don't know right mm. um and but if you can bear the risk sure and you can do this for the long term this might be a fantastic time for you but yeah. be ready that that it's very very risky and that's that's more true than it was and you can then you know if you think about it right before this this happened this coronavirus happened we the future risk of the market was some of the lowest that had ever been in history. So basically, it was like the world was saying the world isn't risky, and boy did that turn out to be untrue. Right? Yeah, yeah. So let, lesson to the wise there, but but it's you know just make no mistake, the world is a lot riskier. Should you invest into that? Well, don't assume that you invest into it because you some so somehow have a magic wand where yeah. you know. Or crystal ball. <laughs> if you do, please tell me. Get in touch. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but but and I can tell you this is one. I mean, not to sound older than I am, but I've worked in finance for a very very long time and met a lot of really really bright people that also work in finance. And I've never met anyone that I felt could consistently tell me which way the market was going to go. And so just be aware if you think you know that. Okay. And we also have a huge tendency when we've done this in the past, we have a huge tendency to remember when we were right and forget when we were wrong. Mm. Not just when we tell other people the stories of how brilliant we are, but there's a huge, not just in, in the market in general, but also in the individual stocks. So um, so just be aware of all that. So I'm not saying you can pick, pick which way the markets are going to go, 
But I'm saying, if, you know, if you can afford the risk, yeah, you can reasonably expect to make more money in the long term from equities now than you could in the past when they were lower risk. Okay. So I know that's exci- an exciting answer, right? Because no, it's much it's, better. It's brilliant. By the way, whenever I'm on advice. media, I, I never get asked that because it's so boring. Like, <laughs> he's the guy who's saying you can't take anything, just go put it away forever, don't pay fees. Their advertisers always complain that I'm not selling them to buy, buy and sell a lot of stuff. <laughs> but it works for the long term. Okay. All right, Lars, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, if everyone that's watching this video, go and check out Lars's YouTube channel and check out his books because it really does demystify investing. You realize it's not rocket science, a slow and steady investment into a, a global index ETF that's cheap, doesn't crystallize lots of fees and brokerage and taxes is a brilliant way to go. And by investing on a regular basis, whether it be $10 a week, $20 a week, whatever you can do, slow and steady throughout a moving market helps reduce a lot of this risk that we're talking about right now.